and that we would be obedient to that. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's thank Claude for coming today. So the good news for you is um, uh, when I do an interview, you get a shorter message. So it's win-win all the way around. We're talking about common challenges, the stuff that everybody goes through, but often we don't handle it in really good ways. So how do we manage that? And, and we've talked about things like, how do we handle blind spots? Because we've all got them. Uh, how do we handle being overlooked by someone? Because it happens to all of us. Uh, how do we deal with fear? Because we've all known moments where our anxiety gets elevated and it seems to paralyze us. And today we're gonna talk about the common challenge of a toxic environment. What happens when you're in a place that's not safe for you? And I'm really grateful for stories in scripture like the one we're going to look at today because it provides so much incredible information to us to help us know how to navigate those kinds of things. So we're in 1 Samuel 18, and uh, beginning in verse 1, it said, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan, who is Saul's son, uh, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. Basically brought him into the employ of the palace, and he began to work there. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic, and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. And it's incredible symbolism here. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs, with timbrels and lyres, and they danced and they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. And Saul was very what? Um, It's really astonishing how often anger masks other things. When a person is angry, it's really hard to know why they're angry. And we're grateful because scripture gives us insight into what is driving the anger of Saul. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. He's not just monitoring. He's looking at him constantly for any evidence of fault or failure that he can use against him. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. This is a complicated text. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre. And as he usually did, or as he usually did, and Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him. How many times? You know, if he didn't like the song, just ask for a different song. (laughs) That's really tough. Um, Here's what's true. Eventually, we will find ourselves in an environment where people... Um, don't necessarily love us. Uh, We're not prepared for this. We're not trained for this. We're not told how to handle things like this. We come in contact with people who do not think we're wonderful, and they exercise options that are difficult for us to deal with. They criticize us. They tease us. They avoid us. They attack us. They abandon us. They curse us. They snub us. They stab us in the back, and they treat us like a doormat. And let's just check. How many have had any or all of the above happen to you at some point in your life? Yeah, And we're just not ready for that experience. Uh, We're unprepared for it. And uh, that's why stories like this in Scripture are so incredibly helpful because they give us insight not just to the common challenge, which is a little bit of a relief to find out we're not alone, but also as to maybe some uncommon responses that change the outcome for us. And uh, so we're told something really perplexing. I'm I'm sure you noticed that the Bible says that an evil spirit went from the Lord and came forcefully on Saul and improperly interpreted. This becomes a real problem in Scripture. 
a lot of people have the opinion that God is just more or less playing a game and he capriciously selects good things to happen and bad things to happen and so he just sent a bad spirit to Saul and then this whole thing starts to play out. It's actually a poor interpretation of the events. You see, Saul had made some very clear and conscious choices in his life that put him in diametric opposition to God. And what's happening here is that God is just simply giving him more of what he has already chosen. And the consequences are so incredibly devastating that it often appears like punishment. That's why our choices are so incredibly important. And so Saul is struggling with uh, kind of dark and demonic thoughts. He goes into deep moods that nobody seems to be able to pull him out of. Uh, somebody, uh, people in the palace are trying to figure out how they can help Saul. Somebody comes up with the idea, maybe music will help. And uh, we use music all the time for kind of mood-altering things. If, if you're in a romantic mood, there's certain music you will play. I was, I was driving home from Holmes, New York yesterday. It's about a five-hour trip. And I passed this young lady in a blue car who was dancing as furiously as is possible while still driving. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. It made me anxious. But why was she doing it? And I thought to myself, maybe she's trying to keep awake. Or maybe she has way more energy than I do. I don't know. I, you know, I, I might nod my head a little. <laughs> it's about as exciting as it gets for me. But they, people have always used music to alter their moods, and so they thought this might help King Saul, and it did. That when David, who was a skilled musician and a skilled vocalist, when he used those skills in the presence of the king, it was like light began to rise and push back some of that darkness in the thoughts of King Saul. But one day something snaps, and he just picks up a spear and hurls it, intending to kill David. And this doesn't just happen. It happens once. It happens more than once. And by the way, that's not the only attempts that King Saul had on David's life. Some of them were simple, and some of them were complex. One of the more complex ones involved... David's marriage to his daughter, Michael, who actually loved David. And so uh, King Saul was not very happy about that, but he didn't know how he could uh, keep it from happening. And so what he decided is that he would give David a Herculean task that would put him at such risk that either he wouldn't do it or he wouldn't survive it. And David actually completed the Herculean task. He actually did it twice and not only survived it, but got the daughter's hand in marriage. And so King Saul, I'm not making this up, he puts a death squad outside of David's home and waits for the morning and they're going to come in and they're going to kill him in his own house. And so Michael, Saul's daughter, found out about this and this plot. And so she warned David. And they, they did this. They made a dummy that they put in the bed. And to make it look a little more realistic, they put a goat hair wig on it. I know some of you are thinking right now, I need to read the Bible more. I, I didn't know these stories were in there. This is, by the way, not the story we teach the children in the class down the hall, you know? the death squad outside the door, and the only way to escape is a dummy in the bed with a goat hair wig. This is not something you want to teach children. And some of you are wondering why I'm saying it to you. So, so uh, they come into the house, and, and, and Michael comes out and says to them, David can't come out to see you right now. He's not feeling well. And evidently, there was some ancient code of ethic that said that you're not allowed to kill a person who's sick. And so they go back to King Saul and said, well, he said, did you kill him? They said, well, we couldn't. He wasn't feeling well. <laughs> and, and King Saul goes into this unbelievable rage. And he just says, you drag his bed here and I'll kill him myself. And they go to drag the bed. And when they get there, that's when they discover that it's a, a dummy with a goat hair wig. And that did not lower Saul's temper one bit. So the question is, what had David done to deserve all of this? And here's what you should know. It is possible to be disliked because you do something good. This is hard for us to, to come to grips with. What did David do? He killed a giant and brought an entire nation out from underneath oppression. He brought relief to a troubled king. He didn't call attention to himself. He wasn't trying to make a name for himself. And for doing all of this good, he was almost killed. It kind of reminds you of someone else, doesn't it? 
who did nothing but good, but actually was put to death. We expect to get attacked and accused when we mess things up. But when we're attacked for doing good, it does something to us that is difficult for us to process. So what is the thing that kept David from being destroyed? Destroyed either by just abandoning the call of God on his life and fleeing, or destroyed by actually allowing the evil to saturate into his heart and becoming like King Saul himself. And the answer is friendship. Friendship is what it was that protected David from being destroyed. This chapter actually began with a a statement that Jonathan became one in spirit with David and loved him as himself. This friendship forged a covenant that was unbelievable. We often don't think of friendship as being an important part of our spirituality. We all know we're supposed to pray and we all know we're supposed to be generous. We all know we're supposed to to, uh, uh, read scripture. We, We all know that we're supposed to serve. But a lot of times we don't think of the incredible value, spiritual value of friendship. David and Jonathan didn't have a friendship that was based on using each other. David wasn't using Jonathan to get closer to the king. Jonathan wasn't using David because David was popular. In fact, this friendship cost both of them dearly. They didn't become friends just to make use of someone. And the pure force of evil in Saul would do incalculable damage to David if it were not for this friendship. This is how David survived. Both Saul and Jonathan had discerned God's spirit and God's plans on David's life. Saul hated David for that. Jonathan loved David for that. And it's Jonathan's friendship that kept Saul's hatred from entering David's heart. Because that's what needed to be protected. So why is friendship so powerful? And the first is is that because friends can call us out. Friends just call us out. A friend can speak into our lives and challenge us when we're being inconsistent or living beneath what our reasonable expectations are. They don't leverage that to destroy us or destroy the friendship. They just call us out. I'm I'm not exactly sure how women do it. I I know guys just kind of look at each other and go, well, that was not cool. And that's that. I don't know how women do it. I suspect there's more words than maybe tea involved, but there's a a process, (laughs) something they do. Why is that important? Because we are capable of incredible, unbelievable rationalization and justification. And those forces put us on a trajectory in life that should terrify us. We need friends to call us out. And we also need friends who can call us up. A friend can often notice something of potential in us and speak to it. They can discern something in us that is deeply true and noble about us. And when they confirm that, the effect in our lives is stunning. If it has ever happened to you, you will never forget it as long as you live. It ranks as one of the most significant moments in your life. Lots of people will never look past your appearance. Lots of people will have nothing to do with you because they can't see how you can benefit them. Lots of people will make a snap judgment and they will just put you in a category that you cannot escape from in their thinking no matter what. That's what lots of people do. But every once in a while you can find someone who that's not what they're trying to do. They're not trying to use you. They're not trying to develop just an instant connection. They're in it for the long haul. When you find a person who can discern your weakness and doesn't use it against you or discern your strengths and doesn't attack you for it, when you find someone who can see something that's true in you and confirm it, you need that. We're created for that. And it's why David was able to survive this toxic environment he was in. Without without it, David would just have abandoned God's call or turned evil himself. But because of friendship, David had a third option. He didn't have to choose between those two things. There's lots of challenges we're going to face in our life. And I wish I could tell you that your spirituality will give you a pass on all of those things. But it's simply not true. What is true is that God will send resources in our life that will prepare us to be able to not only endure it, but to get through it and to be victorious over it. And among those resources is friendship. So how do you find friends? Maybe you're sitting here this morning and says, that sounds like a a great idea. Where do I find one? And what I would tell you, it's not like Facebook. 
I will also tell you, don't ask. Don't go up to someone and say, will you be my friend? That never goes well. <laughs> By the way, don't unnecessarily eliminate people from being potential friends because you don't like the way they look or you don't assume that they will add anything to your status or maybe they will even knock you down a peg if you hang around people like that. Don't eliminate them. Don't pretend to be someone you're not just to get the person you want. It never goes well. So how do we find friends? Well, the first thing I would recommend is this. Do things you enjoy with people who share that interest. Do something with people who are doing the same thing. Just try that. You know, I know people who do things they don't like because they want to be with people that they think they will like. And it doesn't go well. By the way, if you're doing things with people that are doing the same things, it doesn't mean that you will all have the exact same view. Okay? You're all in church here today. All right? I'm glad you're here. And uh, you, you could have just looked at the snow this morning and decided, if God can't make it stop snowing, I'm not going. It's just <laughs> how it is. So, but let's just check. How many Bills fans do we have in the room? How many Steelers fans do we have in the room? Always with the Steeler fans. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Philadelphia fan. I know there's one. <laughs> Some oh, there's two of you. Oh, great. Oh, three now. It's a contagious thing. When you win a Super Bowl, all of a sudden, everybody wants to be. Yeah. And so it's so easy to start thinking that if we're doing the same thing, we all have to think the same thing. And this isn't about preferences. This is about being able to find things that we have in common that we enjoy doing together. It's not important that you try to change Philadelphia fans into Bills fans. I'm not even sure God can do that. <laughs> Don't turn them into battles, just turn them into discovery opportunities. Second, be dependable. If you're going to be a friend, be available, be dependable. It doesn't mean you have to shadow them 24-7, but there's going to be times when they need to talk or they need to pray. And you want to be there for them, and they should be there for you. Uh, talk it out, work it out, figure it out. Really important. And then be transparent. Uh, if you hide your heart, you can't develop friendships. This is not about you just going on an unending rant where you think you're disclosing you know, your heart. You're not disclosing your heart. You're disclosing your attitude. That's two very different things. Uh, it's not about venting, and it's not about... It's just about being honest. There are things you struggle with. There are things that you enjoy. There, there are things that are hard. There are things that are easy. There are things that you're good at. There are things that you, you fail at. And in a friendship, you can say all those things. You know, I, I had a person who I thought was a friend once. And uh, all of a sudden, he didn't show up. We worked at the same place. He didn't show up at work. I, I thought he was sick. I swung by his house. I'm not making this up. The house wasn't there. The house was gone. I couldn't figure it out. It's not easy to get rid of a house. <laughs> but this had been in works, and so he, they, they had torn the house down, and, and he had other plans, moved out of town, out of state, never said a word. If people are making big decisions in life and they're not talking about it with people that they've developed a connection with, whatever else it is they are, they're not friends. You got you to be transparent. And then don't forget you already have a great friend. See, Jonathan put his life at risk for his friend, but Jesus gave his life for his friends. When you experience the friendship of Christ, it actually helps you risk other friendships because Jesus always wants what's best for you and you can tell him absolutely anything and he never rejects you. He will speak truth to you and he will confirm the most incredibly powerful and amazing things that are true about you. And he will challenge you to let go of lesser things. This is what our great friend does. And this great friend told us, didn't he? Greater love has no one than this. And he would lay down his life for his friends. They were not good friends to him. They couldn't stay awake when he needed them the most. And they ran away when it looked like things were getting scary. But Jesus is always a good friend, even when we're not. Let's bow our heads this morning.
Uh, Father, I know there are I know there are people in the room who this is absent in their life, and it hurts them to even talk about it, to hear of it, because their heart craves it. They don't have it. And I ask that you would open their eyes. There may well be some people near them that they've not thought seriously about. They could be a good friend. Uh, someone who will be consistently available, someone who wants what's best for them. Uh, someone that they can share things with and it doesn't get shared someplace else. I also ask that you would give us patience with this kind of thing because these kinds of friendships don't develop in an instant. We can be instantly attracted, but to develop this kind of friendship takes incredible trust and that takes time. And I ask that you would give us the gift of being able to give others time. And I ask that you would bring friends into our lives so that when evil times come, we have an option that we hadn't thought of before. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.